Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. So hopefully a lot of you are watching from our new website um, and we have a great chat module on there. So click and sign into chat. Um, and if you're seeing this on YouTube after the fact, remember you can always catch us live Sundays, 9.30 Eastern time. Um, but tonight's session is focusing, what's the point? And it's gonna be presented by Greg Marshall. Oh, excuse me. After the fact, I had to remind myself to do this a few times. I hear the echo of my voice coming from the other side. But um, as always, before I uh, we go into the presentation, I do want to show off our image of the week. And there is now a place to share your. Um, sorry about this. Uh, there is now a place to share your images of the week on our website. You just submit them on our website. We see them. And uh, basically, you're in contention, and then we do what we do every week, uh, or I should say every weekend. Um, but this uh, image is a mosaic that goes to Nigel Gilchrist. It's uh, a pretty crazy mosaic. Uh, I, I feel like he was chasing all the interest in Orion. Really, really cool uh, way to do it. Um, and I believe, did he say it was his first mosaic? Uh, I thought I saw that it was his first mosaic, but... Uh, Really cool photo, and if you if you want to check it out, uh, it is not yet on our website, but starting next week, all of the images of the week will be on our new website, and um, we'll have kind of a nice, cool place to hang out. Uh, so I am going to take my screen back. Adam, Adam, before you leave us there, can you tell us, um, does the um, chat over in the in the uh, how many chats do we have going here um so oh yeah well i'm i'm about to get into that uh the chat on youtube is still working but if you're watching this on youtube come on over to the astroimagingchannel.com you'll see a chat right there sign on you can sign on as a guest that's perfectly fine and then you'll be able to get in in the chat um i'm not monitoring the youtube chat anymore so i basically left it open today only because uh well, this, since it's our first time, it could break, and I didn't want to ruin the party. But um, from now on, I, we're basically just going to monitor the chat that's on the website. And I also wanted to say thank you to Eric Coles because uh, the chat's actually kind of expensive. It's the most expensive part of the website. And Eric volunteered to pay for a year's worth of chat, which is uh, kind of pretty penny. But... Uh, being that we're paying for it, if it breaks, we can always complain. Um, and you, you, a lot of you who are on Google Plus have probably noticed that they're trying to force us to change, and it's going to break a lot of the uh, a lot of the old stuff. So uh, now we're kind of safe from that. But uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand this right over to Greg. And Greg, I see you're muted. Uh, do I need to unmute you? Let's see. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, you know you're. We, Am I on? <laughs> you're on. You you kind of cut out a little bit, but give it a shot, and we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. Well, let me uh, do a screen share here. And then bring up the presentation. Okay, so I hope this isn't uh, too basic for you guys. So first, I want this title. Um, you know, what focusing about is is finding the point at which we get the the sharpest possible image. But the process of focusing can be so frustrating a lot of people a lot of beginners especially up on it I have to do a little disclaimer here uh, I have a small business watcher at observatory and I manufacture uh, a few tools for astronomy one of which is uh, uh, focus motors and controllers so I'm, I'm not going to discuss them uh, or, or any of the competitors specifically but a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is closely related to it so I'm going to try to be unbiased but you know so what is focus? A focused image is a lot like other optical aberrations uh, that can corrupt an image. 
the ray fan plot, and I'll show you that in a minute, is a diagonal line rather than flat. Focus is a pretty nice aberrations go because you can correct it very simply by moving the eyepiece or image sensor. Uh, but being out of focus can magnify the effect of other aberrations. Um, now, important thing to bear in mind through all of this is that by diffraction, always have a range over which focus doesn't matter. That is uh, the critical focus zone. So here's the, the ray fan plots that I was talking about. So when you are perfectly in focus and there's no aberrations, you just get uh, these horizontal lines. Aberrations, you get these diagonal lines. Here's what coma looks like, a very common aberration uh, for reflectors. Now, what happens if you combine coma and defocus, you can see effect, um, especially on the, the very left-hand side, uh, makes everything worse than it would be uh, without the, the focus or defocus. So here's the, the critical focus zone diagram. Um, you have a certain size of airy disk shown by that little red arrow. And so within that range, critical focus zone, it just doesn't get. Now the critical focus zone is proportional strictly uh, to the focal ratio. You square the focal ratio and multiply it by factor. It says 2.2 microns here, equal to 2.5, but somewhere in that range. Let's do a brief review of focusers. So, you know, what if it's pretty straightforward? You just change the effective distance between the objective and the eyepiece or image sensor. Um, but the quality of a focuser is really defined by what it doesn't do. A good focuser does not put the sensor off from the optical axis. It doesn't change the position of the sensor in any way. Other than else, it doesn't wobble with reasonable force to the side, and it doesn't have backlash. So almost all focusers are basically a pair of nested tubes, one that moves out within the other. But here's a classic rack and pinion mechanism. Uh, but there's two different ones here. On the left, we see a very bad rack and pinion. Uh, you can see that it has a very narrow uh, rack um, and rather crudely made. And there's a feather touch, and I wasn't going to open it up so you could see the insides of it, but uh, trust me, it's a, a much, much better mechanism. Now, Crayford focusers are popular. Um, and with some good reason. Uh, the nice thing for focuser is that it's very easy to make a, a very precise instrument because you're dealing strictly with uh, circular and, and flat surfaces. Uh, it's, it's very easy to factor these things. But a Crayford is less tolerant of dust um, and, and can be prone to slipping. Uh, obviously, you have that surface there between the, the high pressure uh, rod and, and a flat surface. So anything that gets underneath that is going to corrupt it. In most SCTs, you just focus by moving the primer in and out, and it really just slides along that tube. Um, so in theory, this works great. In practice, almost all of them will not tra travel uh, perfectly. People like helio focusers. It's an extremely helio focuser. Um, oh, what do we have? Um, our human vision is often lower risk. Especially our eyes focus mechanism actually compensates uh, for, for some of the, the uh, error in the telescope's focus. Um, 
for sensors, the cycle time of the sensor uh, is, is a problem, especially when there's no bright star available or exposures. So optical issues and defects can mask focus errors. Field curvature and chromatic aberration, other optical aberrations, and perhaps most importantly, seeing because the and by seeing and atmospheric turbulence. This affects almost all observations and measurements that we can make of focus. How do we deal with chromatic aberration and focusing? Well, obviously the best thing is to eliminate or reduce it. Um, so you can, by getting a better telescope, big dollars, or a little bit less dollars, you can use a, a filter, such as a, a minus violet or a fringe killer filter. Um, for one-shot color cameras, it's, it's best to focus on the, the green channel because it's in the, the middle. However, since you get um, the biggest problem with chromatic aberration in the blue and violet, Sometimes you can get a better image by uh, focusing on the blue channel. So another obstacle is uh, various mechanical issues. You have vibration, which frankly mostly comes from contact. Uh, you have backlash, and sometimes you have lack of uh, fine adjustment. The, the pictures here are of the focus, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the reduction mechanism in, in a fine focus uh, knob. Uh, really nice mechanisms. They, they tend to work very, very well, give you very little backlash and just work, except that most of them will slip uh, if enough load on it. This happens to be a feather touch and in my experience I've never seen one of those slip. I don't know how they do it. Focus motors. Adding a motor can help a lot with the mechanical issues. EG motor lets you control without touching it. Um, and if you have the proper gearing on the motor and proper control of it, you get much finer control. But an absolute positioning motor, and this can be either a stepper or a stepper motor or a servo, uh, although it's almost a stepper, um, this can provide compensation, repeatable, automatic focusing with suitable software, and optionally temperature compensation. We'll get into that a lot more later. So what is backlash compensation? Well, let's first of all talk about backlash. I didn't really go into any detail on this, but just in case anybody isn't clear on this, what we mean by this is that if you're moving the knob in one direction and then change direction, respond. It takes a little while. You have to take backlash before you actually start making adjustment in the other direction. So a focus controller can automatically eliminate the backlash um, by applying a calculated movement in the right direction to eliminate the backlash. This is really only practical with uh, focus motors that are absolute positioning type. Ways to do backlash compensation. You can add the desired, uh, add the compensation amount to the desired move whenever there's a change in direction, otherwise not add it. Or you can simply make sure that every move ends with a move in the preferred direction, which is usually in. So we focus in the image. Well, you can choose to star anywhere in the image of focus. The obvious choice would be in the center of the frame. Maybe a better choice would be the center of interest. The theoretically best place, uh, and this is especially true in a refractor, oh, well, I take that back, uh, in any telescope, which is almost all telescopes that have uh, field curvature, the theoretically best place to focus is two thirds way out from the center. So, a practical bit, perhaps a compromise between these these last that is you want to be thirds the way out but out from where um, if there is an object that is really the important part of the image and there's a lot of other stuff that is not so important then you might want to focus that important area 
Um, like one to crop the image, the two-thirds rule applies to the area that will be in the, in the final cropped image. So let's take a closer look at, at what this means here. Uh, looking at this diagram, the black line represents the actual uh, plane of, well, it's not a plane, but the, the surface of a focus, and, and it's curved. Um, so if you focus on the center, uh, the line or the plane shown in, in red here, so it's perfectly in focus at the center, but can be pretty badly out of focus at the edges. If you focus two-thirds of the way out, where that green line is, then you have a relatively small amount of error over the whole range. Um, if you're really lucky, that will all be within the critical focus zone and everything will be as, as well focused as it can be. So another focusing technique with the DSLR especially is live view. And this is a great way to focus if, if you have the feature. Um, the sensitivity is usually limited, so you have to use a bright, uh, which uh, hopefully will be fairly near your uh, object that you're going to photograph. So you point the scope at the bright star, adjust the focus, and then move back to your target. Um, the camera zoomed 100%, um, and hopefully the, the camera can percent view without any interpreter you're seeing real one-to-one -one pixels. Now be aware in a one-shot color camera that you're going to see color artifacts um, and that can actually be useful because sometimes you can't see focus per se but you can see the color artifacts and adjust focus them. Um, likewise be careful with uh, uh, shift um, that is that if you are focusing on a bright star and then move back to your target, if you have any flexure, then the, the focus may shift. So you want to choose a star as close as possible to the target. So if we could just have some software to analyze the focus and, and, and tell us this, um, and, and most systems can do this. Theoretically, this is the, the best indicator, the most direct uh, indication of how sharp your final image will be. Uh, to be able to update the display pretty quickly to actually use this to focus. Uh, and, and looking at numbers is not a very good human interface. There are several different metrics that are used to indicate focus. In fact, I think there are more than than just the, the, the obvious ones. A really bad way to do it is just using the maximum value, that is, what is the brightest pixel in the star. Uh, that's not good because it will vary a lot from a variety of factors. Then we have the uh, full width half, really uh, full width at half maximum, and the very similar uh, half flux diameter. Um, and uh, the expert seems to think that HFD is, is the, the, uh, the best. So we can also use automatic, as I mentioned before. Um, so this requires a suitable focus motor and controller. It is possible to do automatic focusing with a, a simple motor, that is a missioning. Um, don't recommend it. It's, it's not going to be um, very good quality, uh, not, not reliable or repeatable. Um, back at the time I made this, this present, the software that most people used was Focus Max, and at that time it was free. It's no longer free. <laughs> oh, it also requires that you use Max and DL. Um, which is definitely expensive. So get on this in, in a number of uh, capture applications, such as SGP. Focus masks. This is actually my favorite way of, of focusing using uh, a, a bottom off mask. Uh, effectively, what this does is to uh, magnify and give you a direct visual. Uh, 
simulation, if you will, of, of or indication of, of what the focus error is. Um, the reason I like the Botnoff mask is that it gives you a, a function of both the amount and the direction. With many kinds of masks, it's really hard to tell which way to uh, adjust it. Um, you, you definitely want to do this at the full resuming any binning. And generally speaking, you use an exposure of around three seconds or more so that you're averaging out the effects of seeing. Now, here's a little trick that I've come up with that I call the down and out rule. Um, Vagger orientation of the Botnoff mask relative to the camera. That is, if the bottom of the image is down here, you want the straight lines on the mask to be then you will get a pattern on, on the right. So the down and out rule says that if you want to move the horizontal uh, row of, of uh, the horizontal line down, you move the focuser out, thus down and out. Even better, you can use this software called Botnoff Grabber with a Botnoff mask. To do this is that it can measure the error in focus much more precisely than you can ever see with your eye. Um, and it gives you uh, an indication of the amount of error uh, in, in microns, assuming that you've properly uh, put in the parameters of your uh, focal and aperture. And, and, and it's free. So once we're in focus, how do we maintain it? Well, fully due to temperature change, uh, it could change because of slippage uh, in, in the focuser. So how do we deal with focus shift? Well, generally focus, uh, whenever you detect a, a you could also do an auto operation between shots uh, using some scripting. If it's not built into your application. Um, we also have to be aware of the fact that filters change the effective focus. Filter shifts the focus by approximately one third the, the thickness of, of the, uh, the filter. So you can buy a set of filters that manufacturer claims are parfocal, but really, at, at the, the faster your telescope, the more critical. Uh, the, the smaller the, the uh, critical focus zone is going to be. So when they say par focal, um, at what focal ratio do they mean? They may experience they're, they're never perfectly. Maintain focus is temperature compensation. So how does temperature affect focus? Well, most obviously, and in fact, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that this is the only uh, way that temperature affects focus, that we have a coefficient of expansion in the tube or, or, or truss, and this is just the uh, properties of the material that it's made out of. But in reality, we also have changes in the optics themselves, um, either the type of glass and, and the design uh, such as the spacing between elements, uh, has a big impact on, on how temperature affects that. Um, with mirrors, likewise, the type of glass and, and the thickness ratio, uh, um, the thickest and thinnest parts of the mirror. I'll be showing you some more of that in a second. Note that we're talking here about um, a global temperature change. Uh, if you have a temperature change or difference across the optics, there really isn't anything that, that you know about that. That's just going to corrupt everything, not just in terms of focus, but uh, it's going to create aberrations. So here's a, a, a telescope, and, and at the top we see uh, a line that shows that the, the tube changes. Uh, Generally speaking, it shrinks as the temperature drops. But with temperature compensation, the focuser then moves out. And the bottom shows that the distance to the image plane remains constant. 
Now this part is actually very, very simple and you wouldn't really need to do any training uh, in the system if, uh, it, if this was really all that was involved in, in focus shift. Uh, you, you either have uh, aluminum, steel, or carbon fiber uh, that the, the uh, tube is made of. Uh, in every scope I've ever seen them. And they have pretty constant coefficients uh, of expansion. They're in carbon. Uh, very, very low. The only thing that affected range of, of focus, then we could just all use carbon fiber scopes and the problem would be solved. Uh, but in fact, that's, that's not the case. Um, in a refractor, difference in thickness between the edge and the center very large and that means that the difference in uh, expansion um, between the, the center and the edge can be and that can make for a big difference in focus. Um, the interesting thing about this is that lenses tend to change focus with temperature in the opposite direction that the coefficient of the tube does. So theoretically, you could have a telescope that is athermal uh, because the two things would cancel each other out. In reality, that uh, never happens. For a mirror, as I said before, uh, even if it's a relatively thin mirror, you still have a pretty small difference uh, between A and B, and so there tends to be less sensitivity to temperature. Um, actually, back there and making another point that this is for a, a simple uh, reflector. In a uh, Cassegrain telescope, it's a lot more complex because there's actually a magnification of the error that both mirrors are curved. Well, how does temperature compensation work? Well, basically you just measure the, the temperature and you can measure it in many different places. Uh, first of all, you, you can just measure the ambient temperature, but if you measure the, the, the scope itself, the tube, uh, you can put it in the middle of the tube uh, you can put it close to the glass elements, uh, which might help if that is the, the dominant feature. However, you can't really measure the temperature of the glass itself in, in a refractor. Um, so you, really, you're just measuring the, the, the tube. The thing that you want to be really careful of is, is to keep the temperature sensor away from any sort of heat, such as a dew heater. Once we have established a, a, a way to measure temperature, uh, we need to calibrate it. That is, that we measure the chin, uh, position, uh, that is focus, and the change in temperature. Uh, you want to get the largest possible deltas and do that uh, over a normal operating temperature. If you're operating, it's not characteristic of uh, normal operation. Um, so the temperature compensation system will then calculate a new position based on the changes in temperature. Um, now this, and in some cases, in some controllers, it is simply an incremental process. That's not a good way to do it. Um, the way it should be done is to establish a reference point that is a, a reference reference our starting position and temperature, recalculate the new position based on that reference rather than just a change from the last correction. So when do we make corrections? Um, we don't want to have the uh, system make an adjustment to focus every time there is a detected change in temperature because most of the changes will be too small to matter but making that correction can result in other problems, uh, including accumulation. It also would be nice if we could limit it to making adjustments between exposures because there is the potential 
um, with some focusers more than others, uh, for the focuser to wobble a little bit as it's uh, motor to, to adjust the focus. So, point here. We want sharper images and more details and confidence in the full width half maximum measurement so that we can work on other problems such as guiding. Point, stay sharp. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, Greg. Thanks uh, for a really nice presentation. Um, there were some questions and some discussions in uh, chat and uh, Let's see, I'm scanning back up so I could get to the beginning of it. Um, I think uh, one of the first questions was in regards to uh, the, the fact that you're not in focus throughout the whole field. Um, I forget how you phrased it, but uh, yeah, two thirds out from center. Um, and then Wes was asking, how do you do that in focus max or at focus? And uh, Dylan then asked, just choose a star two thirds out. Is it that simple? It is that simple. But let's back up a little bit and and be sure that everyone understands that uh, almost all telescopes are not designed for photography, and therefore they do not deal with curvature of field. Um, you know, for visual use, it really doesn't matter because as I pointed out there, your eyes focus will actually compensate for some amount of focus. Uh, but the sensor can't do that. Um, it has to have a perfectly flat field. That, that's why we use field flatteners or scopes that are really designed to give you a flat field. But yes, if you uh, need to uh, this compromise, then you just choose a star that is two thirds of the way out, and that's what you're focused on. Yep. And for those of us that use Sequence Generator Pro, uh, it averages all the stars throughout the field, so it tells us where the, in a sense, tells us which the average star is, or, or almost makes that irrelevant. Uh, but Wes pointed out that he thinks Focus Max is working on multi star focusing. <laughs> So, um, uh, John Minerva asks, is there a difference? Yeah, I'm not sure that that is. Oh, I'm lost, sorry, go ahead. I lost your audio at the end there. You're not sure? Well, I was starting to say, I'm not sure that, that uh, just uh, arbitrarily focusing on uh, an average of all stars is the best thing to do. Um, well, yeah, I guess I, I would have to think about that a bit. It depends upon, um, you know, the two-dimensional distribution of stars relative to uh, that's out. You know, where, where do all the stars fall in, in that frame? Right. Don't know. Yeah. No, I, I understand that, yeah, because if you're, I guess if you think about a poorly designed optical system where the average focus isn't, I'm trying to think, isn't uh, necessarily distributed evenly. Uh, it might not put you in best focus throughout the entire field. Um, but I'm- Right. I'm so like it, in SGP- Go ahead. Sorry, again, I'm- <laughs> um, In SGP, can you select, if you, if you don't want to use full frame focusing, yes. can, can you select an area? Yes, you can. And you that, can that would be- Yeah, I don't know if you can, you, you can eliminate the perimeter. I don't know if you can eliminate the interior. Um, in other words, to give yourself like a donut of focus around the two thirds perimeter, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, but you can like say- Well, how about just a rectangular area? That yes, is yes. Yeah, take okay. <laughs> it's one of those you have to use. You have to think it over. I'm not quite sure. I do. I do like the way it works, but um, Adam, I, I believe it's a, what we would call a central rectangle, and you can exclude areas outside of that central rectangle. 
which means that you would be back to focusing on an average of the stars in the center. In the center, yes. Yeah. I, I tend not to go there because my stars okay. in the center are That's off. Less Are <laughs> cut out. The audio is a little okay when you're talking on your own on your own for a little bit, but when we're cross talking, it always gets messed up. Um, the other the other question that came in was, uh, is there a difference between using a DC versus a stepper motor when autofocusing? And if you want to go ahead with that, uh, I'm sorry. The you know, the question was using. A DC a motor versus a, DC a stepper motor versus a stepper motor when autofocusing. Right. So yeah, the the problem with DC motors is that um, you know how much they move depends upon many many factors. Uh, you know, such as the load, and and the load is going to vary with the temperature and with the angle. You know, if you're pointing uh, fairly low in the sky, uh, then there's less load versus pointing at the zenith. Um, so in, in general, a, a simple DC motor, uh, although you can do it, and it might give you better results than, than manual focusing, it is definitely not reliable enough uh, that you would want it for, um, you know, a, a scripted automatic thing, you know, because it, it could, uh, go through a cycle and, and tell you that it's perfectly in focus and it isn't. Yeah. Yep. Definitely agree there. Um, Jeff asked, uh, how do filters shift focus? Well, filters uh, have a refractive index and um, so as the light passes through it, you, you get a, a small change in, in the path of the light, the rays. All right. Um, John is asking a very difficult question to answer generally. Uh, when using a manual focuser on a refractor, how often do you recommend refocusing when imaging an object? Uh, he realizes it's temperature dependent, but what's a rough guide? Well, it, it, it does depend upon the, the telescope. Um, you know, much it is affected by a telescope is, is different. Um, and, and also, of course, on, on how critical the focus is, which is basically the focal ratio. So if you're using a really fast scope, like an F4 or 5.6, uh, then it's going to really demand uh, that you stay on, on top of the focus. Um, some telescopes will, will change a lot with it and others not so much. I, I pointed out in, in the discussion there that um, the change in focus due to the uh, temperature effect on the optics is usually in the opposite direction from the temperature coefficient of the tube um, and, and so thing. Um, but it means that every scope is, is different and it can be a very large difference. I have had telescopes that uh, where, where the the uh, coefficient of expansion of the tube was a bigger factor, uh, and other scopes where the temperature effect on the optics was the bigger factor. Um, in that latter case, you end up with a negative uh, temperature coefficient. And I suspect that that's actually more common. I think that in general, with refractors, temperature changes more than it does the tube. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of the uh super premium reflectors these days uh, they say are pretty stable focus wise because they're made mostly of carbon fiber and they have uh, designed them well but uh, it, it just goes to show you it completely depends on the specific well elements. you know what um, go ahead if if I wanted a telescope that had no 
focus shift with temperature, and, and I do. Uh, <laughs> what I would do is to get a, a scope that uses uh, quartz uh, for the mirror um, and a carbon fiber tube, because the quartz has a very uh, good thermal characteristics as does the carbon fiber. So you minimize both sides of it that way. Um, that only works with uh, re reflecting telescopes, of course. Right. Um, if you're refocusing during the night, wouldn't changing the focus affect flat frame calibration? Ah, uh, uh, well, <laughs> theoretically, yes, but um, in practice, I mean, first of all, we're making very, very small adjustments in, in focus. Uh, but more importantly, you know, we're adjusting focus in order to stay in focus. So that means that if you're successful on it, in fact, um, all of the frames uh, will, will be at exactly the same focus point. Um. Sorry, just reading through. Uh, that I believe is most. Are the, those are most of the questions. Um, actually, those are all the questions. Um, but uh, Greg, I do want to thank you again for coming on and uh, basically telling us about focus. Um, we are. Uh, going, yep. We're going to have uh, a session next week, of course. I don't know what it is, but it'll be posted sometime midweek. Uh, for the time being, uh, check out our new website. Enjoy the chat because it's actually going to be 24-7. So if you do uh, get stuck in the middle of nowhere with internet, you can jump on and see if anybody's in here watching the Astro Imaging channel. Um, share your images of the weeks. And uh, we have some other stuff coming. If you have any ideas for what you'd like to see on the website, uh, let me uh, let me know because uh, I'm uh, kind of hot to trot with this new website and enjoy kind of playing around with it. But uh, again, Greg, thank you, and uh, see you guys all next week.